we've got everybody now. So welcome to Math 408, L functions and sphere packing. So today we're going to continue on Fourier series and Fourier analysis. I have given variants of these lectures numerous times in multiple classes over the years, and there are you know, lots of different ways you can go. The standard way that I do it is the Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with you know, the list of you know, rules, results, theorems, lemmas in a nice, well-defined logical order. I've given that so many times I'm kind of bored of it. So I thought let's have a little fun and let's just start talking about Fourier analysis. Treat it more like a senior seminar. What kind of results do you want? And let's see what order you guys choose. So I have deliberately not given you stuff to read. So I'm hoping that you actually haven't seen some of this stuff. So we have Fourier series and analysis. So the big question is, are we working on a finite interval, either 0, 1, or 0, 2 pi, or are we working on the real line? And you can go back and forth between the two. So often on 0, 1, and we'll have maybe f of x is the sum of a n e to the 2 pi i n x, and goes from minus infinity to infinity. Or on the real line, you might have f of x is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f hat of y e to the I think I want it this way without the minus sign. Maybe there's a minus sign there. So the first question is, what kind of functions do you want to look at? Well-defined well ones. Okay, so the function should be at least defined everywhere. But what properties might you want to assume the function has? That it doesn't have the continuity. Okay, uh, no infinite discontinuity. What else might you want it to have? Integrable. I like integrable because that is a weak condition. That's a great condition. And by integrable, maybe we mean L1, maybe we mean L2. There's, there's various types of integrable that we can have. What else might you want the function to have? A little surprised no one is insisting my function have this property. So like a very nice property continuous? Yeah, continuous. Maybe continuous. And once you have continuity, what would come after continuity that would be a little bit stronger? Differentiable. Differentiable. Maybe k times. And if you've heard of Lipschitz conditions, you could actually put a Lipschitz condition here as an intermediary between being differentiable and being continuous. And one question you might ask is, how do these coefficients change as I change my assumptions about f? So the first question is, let's look at the series first. So the first question you might ask is, what is a n? Well, what we're really doing is we're trying to expand our function f as like a sum of a n v n. We're expanding it in some vector system. How would you find the coefficients from linear algebra? We don't have a matrix here. Let's assume, what would you like to assume about your basis Vn? Normal. It's orthogonal. We've got normal, we've got orthogonal. Orthonormal. Orthonormal is orthonormal basis. So you have a bunch of vectors of length one that are mutually perpendicular. And we talked 
I think last time about how the exponential functions are mutually perpendicular. That if you look at the integral of e to the 2 pi i nx, e to the 2 pi i mx, we take the complex conjugate and we integrate from 0 to 1. Well, this is the same as the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the 2 pi i n minus m x dx, which is the integral from 0 to 1 of cosine 2 pi n minus m x dx plus i sine 2 pi n minus m x dx. And what can you tell me about those integrals? Why is one the negative of the other? They're both zero, so they cancel each other out. They're always both zero? If, if n is not m, if n equals m, then we have the cosine of zero, which is one. And as long as n does not equal m, we're integrating sine and cosine through a complete number of cycles. And so the answer is delta nm, which is 1 if n equals m and 0. And I remember the math book I had freshman year remarked that this is the Kronecker delta, and Kronecker is famous for greater contributions to mathematics than this. It's nice notation. Because you can quickly look down, and it's 1 if n and m are the same, 0 otherwise. So the functions e to the 2 pi i and x, these are an orthonormal basis. The question becomes an orthonormal basis for what? What do they span? What functions can be written as a combination? Whenever you have an infinity in mathematics, that is a danger sign. You know, how do we know things converge? But let's think back. So we have f as a sum of a n, v n. You know, this is a linear algebra problem. If you want. You place f with some vector v. How do we find the projection of v into the direction of vn? What should we do to both sides? So let's say I wanted to find the coefficient a1. How would I find the coefficient a1? Dot product with v1. Dot product with v1. So we would look at v dotted with v1 is the sum of a n vn dotted with v1. And because it's an orthonormal basis, this is just going to be a1. The only thing that survives is when n equals 1. And so what this suggests is that a n should just be f dotted with e to the 2 pi i n x. I'll put this in quotes in terms of just how I'm writing things. But it should be the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x e to the negative 2 pi i and x dx. And those are going to be the Fourier coefficients. So there's a nice formula to get the Fourier coefficients. And now we can look at our list of properties we desire f to have, which is the one that's now most important to allow this to proceed. Integrable. Integrable. You know, if you take the special case when n equals 0, you're just integrating f of x. And remember, what does it mean for a function to be integrable? What does it mean for it to be an L1? It means the integral of the absolute value of the function is finite. So you have to be very careful. So for example, let's take p of x to be 1 over pi, 1 over 1 plus x squared. So who can tell me what this function is? Or where it comes from? It is the Cauchy distribution. So if you think of arctangent, the derivative of arctangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. And so that's how we get the normalization constant of 1 over pi. If you take complex analysis, replacing 2 with 4 or 6 or 8 leads to some beautiful formulas. 
nice expressions involving prime. You might argue that this function has mean zero. To calculate the mean, I need to go to minus infinity to infinity of x, 1 over pi, 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. Well, but this is an odd function over symmetric e region, so it should be zero. The problem is what this really means is it's the limit as a and b go to infinity of the integral from a to b of x, 1 over pi, 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. Uh, yes, we'll do negative a, thank you. Or I have to send a to negative, I have to do one or the other. Um, there's definitely a mistake. So most people sadly have not seen improper integrals defined properly for a little fun. And so it's worth just spending a moment about what this means. It means no matter how I'm spreading out, I should get the same answer. So in particular, if I take a equals negative b, or if I take um, 2a equals negative b, well, in the first case, I'll have the integral from minus b to b of 1 over pi x over 1 plus x squared dx. That's 0. And in the second case, I'm integrating from negative b to 2b of 1 over pi x over 1 plus x squared dx. Well, the integral from negative b to b is just 0, right? So this is the same as the integral from b to 2b of 1 over pi x over 1 plus x squared dx. When b is tremendous, x is tremendous, and what is x over 1 plus x squared? It's about 1 over x, so its integral is going to be about log of x. So this should be approximately 1 over pi log of 2b minus the log of b, which is the log of 2 over pi. And of course, if instead of doing 2a, if I did 3a or 4a or 5a, I could change what this is. This tells us we have to be careful. And the problem is that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the absolute value of x, 1 over 1 plus x squared dx, and I guess I should have a 1 over pi, is infinite. The function is non-integrable. So for integrable, we need the absolute value. If you think back to multivariable calculus and Poubini's theorem, Whenever we have infinities, we have to be careful. If the double integral of the absolute value is finite, then shift orders, then change orders of integration, not a problem. So if we want these a's to exist, we need f to be integrable. And if a, and if f is integrable, then we're fine. Any questions about what we mean by this? Okay, can I erase the bottom board? Okay, so we now have a definition of A. What, what should we look at next? What should we think about next? What's the burning question on your mind now? So we know An exists. An is equal to integral from 0 to 1, f of x, e to the negative 2 pi i, and x dx. What should we ask next? That's much later. But it's on the right track. So the question was, does the series converge? What information would you need to know to determine if the series converges? What an is. Be more specific about what an is. It's going to be very hard to calculate an in general. Right. Does an go to zero? Things about the size. So does a n go to zero. If it doesn't, we're dead. So that's a very natural question to ask. Related to that is, 
the size of AM. So the first thing is note that the absolute value of AN is equal to the integral of you know, f of x e to the negative 2 pi i and x dx. And what is true about the absolute value of an integral? It is non-negative. But what can you say? The absolute value of the integral is? Is bounded by the integral of the absolute value. And what do we know about the absolute value of the exponential, e to the negative 2 pi i n x? This is just 1. So this is just equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of the absolute value of f of x dx. That's the L1 norm of the function. So we know at least the ans are bounded. Okay, that's a start. The next thing is we want to know the ans go to zero. And then more than just they go to zero, we want to know something about the speed in which they go to zero. So there is a variety of ways to prove that an goes to zero. There is the expansive general argument that works for all nice functions. And then there is the well, let me make my life easy and assume additional things about f. There is a danger about assuming additional things because maybe your result will not be as applicable generally, or the proof of the general case may be different than the proof of the special case, which should not be surprising because the special case is going to assume something. What do you think might help to assume about the function? What might you want to assume about the function? So, yes? Well, a function is defined on 0, 1, so we know it's integrable, so maybe we want it to be bounded. But what else might you want to assume about the function? What might help you? So, integrable is a very weak condition. Well, if it's continuous on a closed compact oh. interval, then you get uniform continuity for free. What's beyond continuity? Differentiability. Differentiability. What would happen if we assumed f was differentiable? How much of a benefit would that give us? And so we could see what is the impact of being differentiable. Not every function is differentiable, but let's see what that gives us. If f prime exists, then a n is the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x e to the negative 2 pi i n x dx. Now, I know you haven't done complex analysis. I'm going to just play a little fast and loose with the math. If you don't like that, what can you do? <laughs> Good. So one solution is to take complex analysis. I like that attitude. What else could you do if you don't have the time to take complex analysis? I can just expand this and write this as cosine plus i sine, and then just do the integrals twice. So everything I'm saying, you can actually just justify by expanding things out. So does anybody have any thoughts as to how we might be able to use differentiability to try to understand this integral? How could we get differentiability to come into play? How? Maybe we can do some of the extrapolation from there. But I'm saying. I don't know if we solve the extrapolation. But you have an integral of two functions, and I want to somehow get an integral involving f prime. Do you know any rules? 
integration by paths, right? That shit is useful. There was a reason we learned all this stuff. Partial fractions is useful. So we have to, you know, I like to be extremely explicit. I like to write u equals du equals dv equals v equals. Do you think u should be f of x or dv should be f of x? dv. Yeah, we're trying to get f prime to come into play. It's screaming, let u equal f of x. So du is going to be f prime of x dx. dv is e to the negative 2 pi i and x dx. So what is the antiderivative of that? So 1 over negative 2 pi i n, no x, e to the negative 2 pi i n x. And now when we differentiate, they're going to cancel. You happy with this, or is there any warning? So, right, and you could extend, you could do this as cosine plus i sine, and if we do it with cosine plus i sine, it's going to be exactly the same as this, except, of course, now you won't have the exponential, you'll have cosine going to sine. But there's one little thing you should be a little bit concerned about here. Oh, yeah, yeah, what happens if n equals zero? Screw it. It's a technical term. We're trying to understand what happens as n goes to infinity. n equals zero is just one term. So I'm trying to determine if the series converges, one term is not going to affect me. And so I can just assume n is not zero. Now, when you integrate by parts, you get uv at zero, one, minus the integral from zero to one of v du. When you look at v at zero and one, what do you get? What's the exponential? One. one. So v is going to be the same at one and at zero. Wouldn't it be nice if u was the same at one and zero? Then we could just drop this term. So this is going to tell us we want to study functions. So we will assume f of zero equals f of one. Is this true for every function? No. Is, that, is it a big deal if, can I convert my function? How? Do like f of x plus f of like x plus one half of one. But I, I don't want to change the function I'm looking at. Wait. No. Wait. What if I compress things and look at the function, you know, I take the interval 0, 1, and I compress it, so now it goes from 0 to 1 half. And so maybe my function looks like, uh, I'm, I'm a terrible artist, so. Now what could I do? I could reflect it. And if I do something like that, and I can then just continue this. And I can make the function periodic. So is it a big deal? No, I, I, I can just do something like this. What's the one concern you would have in doing something like this? So it might not be different, but how badly could it lose differentiability? Yeah, it'll be piecewise differentiable. Maybe we'll have an issue at 0, 1 half, and 1, which is the same as 0. So is this a huge deal? No. We're only losing differentiability at a point. And so we should probably be able to do some kind of limiting argument and be safe. Henceforth, we will assume we are looking at periodic functions, that f of 0 equals f of 1. 
It's not a horrible deal because of doing arguments like this. And now when we do that, the boundary term, the uv term, is going to vanish. And you're going to get negative v du, the negative and the negative reinforced. So you're going to get a 1 over 2 pi i n integral from 0 to 1 of f prime of x e to the negative 2 pi i n x dx. Does this make you happy? Yes. Why? Uh, we're using the fundamental theorem of calculus. We have f prime involved. We can bound it. We can bound it. And so this is going to be absolute value is going to be less than equal to what? Averaging one minus f of zero to be zero. No, because we still have the exponential function. We have f prime times the exponential. How can we bound this? have a n is the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x e to the negative 2 pi i and x dx. And now we have a n equals 1 over 2 pi i n integral from 0 to 1 f prime of x. So there's a reason I'm deliberately writing it underneath to just highlight how similar they are. What do you know about the size of a n? It's less than or equal to? The integral of f of x. The integral of f, not quite the integral of f of x, close. Absolute value. The integral of the absolute value. Which is just the L1 norm of f. What will that be less than? 1 over n times 1 over n. Yeah, I mean, we can do a little bit better and do 1 over 2 pi n. Yeah, but 1 over n it works because 2 pi is greater than 1. So it's 1 over 2 pi n times. Which is what? Huh. It would be the L1 norm of f prime. So what this is telling you is if the function is differentiable once, it's bounded by 1 over n times the L1 norm of the derivative, so long as, of course, n does not equal 0. Well, if n equals 0, it's actually still true. It's just useless. You know, you're at most positive infinity in absolute value. Wow, thank you. What would happen if the function was twice differentiable? Or k times differentiable? So if you're k times differentiable, what would be true? So 1 over 2 pi into the k times the L1 norm of the kth derivative. So the more differentiable you are, the smoother the function, the more decay we have in the Fourier coefficient. We still have decay in general. It is not the case that every Fourier series converges. And if it converges, it's not the case that it converges to the original function. One of the biggest mistakes I ever made in my life was a first-year graduate student at Princeton. Charlie Pfeffman was giving 
a year-long course on Fourier analysis, including his proof of Carlson's theorem that uh, I believe it states, if you have a function which is square integrable, then the Fourier series converges pointwise almost everywhere. I believe that was the statement. He was not the first one to prove it, but he had a different proof. And so I was actually typing up the notes in Microsoft Word. I didn't know LaTeX back then. LaTeX wasn't as prevalent. And I wish somebody had just kicked me and forced me to learn LaTeX at that time so the notes would be far more valuable. But the idea is the more differentiable you are, the more decay we have, which means the series are going to converge better. And now you can begin to see why screw integrable is so nice. Um, or better yet, why twice differentiable is so nice, because we're going to have a 1 over n squared. That converges. 1 over n, that doesn't. So if the function is uh, twice differentiable, we actually expect the series to converge. So expect series to converge if f is in c2 of 0, 1. So have you seen this notation before? This is the space of twice continuously differentiable functions on 0, 1. And because I'm assuming that they're continuously differentiable, that means my function k or, or f2 is going to be twice differentiable and continuous, so I can still integrate it over a finite interval and still get a finite number. So the series will converge. What do we hope the series converges to? I'm sorry, what? The, the, um, the series, the, the sum of a and f. Sorry. No, no, not, not the coefficients a n. The coefficients a n now go to zero. What do we want the series to go to? Right, and so what we hope, you know, the sum n goes from minus infinity to infinity of a n e to the 2 i i n x equals f of x. So what should we look at now? And I'll define a good object. Sn f of x is the sum, n goes from minus n to n, of a n e to the 2 pi i and x, where a n is the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x e to the negative 2 pi i and x dx. So this is a finite approximation. So what questions might you want to ask about Sn of x? What do you hope is true about Sn as n goes to infinity? It approaches f. So you might want to study f of x minus Sn f of x. And we could look and see what is true about that series. What do you think the zeroth coefficient will be of that of the Fourier series of this? So this is you know, f of x minus the sum and goes from minus n to n of a n e to the 2 pi i and x. Have you used bracket notation for dark product? 
So let's take the dot product of this with e to the 2 pi i mx, where the absolute value of m is at most n. Well, you have the first one dotted with that, and that's going to just give you a m, right? And then the second one, we have you know the sum. We'll have oh the only way this is an orthonormal basis. The only term that survives is when n equals m, right? And so we get a m or zero. So what this is telling us is essentially, wow, what a surprise! You know, we take the projections. We take the function created by just summing up those projections up to plus minus n, and then we say, hey, does it have anything that projects down to the zero, or to the first, or to the second, or to the third? No. We've already taken those projections out. And then the hope is that as you let n go to infinity, because it will project to zero in every direction, that this has to become the zero vector. So this is the high-level hope. The problem is we may not have every direction. This is where you have completeness issues because we now have a vector space with a countable number of basis vectors. So there's going to be real convergence issues. Do you think it's easier to look at an L1 norm or an L2 norm? So if you look at a L2 norm, you have the function times its complex conjugate. It's very easy to take complex conjugates of Sn of f. Absolute value is much harder to work with. We really strongly prefer. Let's look at the L2 norm. And I'll square it. The L2 norm squared of S and F. So this is going to be the integral from 0 to 1 of S n F of x, S n F of x complex conjugate dx. And this is a fundamental observation in the subject, that frequently functions times their complex conjugates become very easy to integrate, especially when you expand them in terms of this basis. Why? Well, we'll have the integral from 0 to 1. We'll have the sum. n goes from minus n to n of a n e to the 2 pi i n x. And I have to use a different letter. Let's use the letter m. It goes from minus n to n of a m e to the negative 2 pi i m x dx. For given choice of n, which m's will contribute? Oh, I'm sorry. It should be a m complex conjugate. So we'll have the integral from 0 to 1, e to the negative, I'm sorry, e to the 2 pi i n minus m x dx. So if I give you an n, which m contributes? When they're the same. So this integral is just delta n m. It's 1 if n equals m and 0 otherwise. So this becomes the sum, n goes from minus n to n of the absolute value of a n squared. What do you think this should equal as n goes to infinity? Conjecture. Should 
Well, right now, it's not the, I've started off with this is the L2 norm of SN of F. So you're extremely close. So just approach the L2 norm of the... Yeah, so here is a reasonable conjecture that this should be the L2 norm of my function. And I want you to think about that for the next class, which I am hoping will be Wednesday. You know, I'm hoping Friday is Mountain Day and Monday is reading period. So I want you to think about, do you believe that this will converge? If so, this gives us a lot of information. And in fact, if we know this, does that give you that the ANs have to decay? So assume the sum when it goes from minus infinity to infinity of a n squared equals the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x squared, absolute value of f squared, which is basically just the square of the L2 norm. What does that tell you about the a n's? What must be true about the ANs? That they obey possible formulas. Oh, they do obey possible formulas. That's a little bit advanced from right now. What must be true about the ANs if this infinite sum equals the L2 norm? What must be happening to the ANs? What? So the sum converges, so, so they have to go to zero. So we initially got the ANs had to go to zero by assuming the function was differentiable. If we assume the function is an L2, then if this formula is true, which we have not proven yet, we do have some information at our disposal. Does anybody know the greatest inequality in all of mathematics? No. More basic than Cauchy Schwartz. X squared is greater than equal to zero. Yes! So kick ass inequality. Although you have to be a little bit more specific. What is X? Um, real. Because yeah. right, if X is complex, then the inequality fails. If X is real, then we have X squared is greater than equal to zero. We can look at f minus Sn of x dotted with f minus Sn of x. This is the L2 norm squared. What do we know about this? It's almost greater than or equal to zero. When we expand this out, so we have 0 is less than or equal to um, the L2 norm of f squared plus the L2 norm of SNF squared, and then minus twice by symmetry. I'll just do it slowly. SNF f minus f s n of f. Yeah. And so the question is, you know, what can you say about something like this? So if we look at, uh, let's say, f s n of f, because the other one is just going to be, I think, the complex conjugate. This is going to be the integral from 0 to 1, f of x, the sum, n goes from minus n to n of a n 
e to the negative 2 pi i and x dx and a complex conjugate on the ans. So this is the sum, and it goes from minus n to n, a n bar, integral from 0 to 1, f of x, e to the negative 2 pi i and x dx. Oh, gee, what's that integral equal to? A n. And so we just get the sum, and it goes from minus n to n, of a n squared, which thankfully is still up on the board as the L2 norm squared of S n of f. And since these two are complex conjugates of each other, we get 0 is less than equal to the L2 norm of f squared plus once, minus once, minus once, minus S n of f L2 norm squared. And from this, we can then deduce that the L2 norm squared of Sn of f, which is the sum, and it goes from minus n to n of a n squared, is equal, I'm sorry, is less than or equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of f squared dx. And since this is true for all n, it's true when the limit as n goes to infinity. Thus, the sum n goes from minus infinity to infinity of a n squared is less than equal to the L2 norm squared. And so we've actually now proven that the a n's go to zero. Just by assuming that the function is L2. Now, what we would want is a little bit more. We want to know when does S n of f converge to f. We did not use any differentiability here. Dirichlet has a beautiful theorem where if we have some differentiability, we have pointwise convergence. If we don't have differentiability, we do not necessarily have convergence. And really crazy stuff can happen. So I'm going to end with just one last little note or I'll leave it as a problem to consider. So right now we've been looking at various spaces for f. We've been looking at f is an L1 on 0, 1. And we've been looking at f is an L2 of 0, 1. This you know, bounded the ANs. This actually gave us the ANs went to zero. What is the natural question to ask about these two spaces? Are they the same? Is there something in one space that's not in the other? Yes. And so Think about whether or not there are functions that are in one that are not in the other. Is one of them contained in the other? And an inequality that was mentioned, which I initially poo-pooed because just x squared greater than equals zero is such a good inequality, but the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality might be useful. It is extremely important to note that this is a finite interval. If you replace this with an infinite interval, then inclusions can be very different. But because we're doing a finite interval, but you always want to ask these questions and get a sense of how strong are the different assumptions? How strong are the different conditions? If I'm assuming my function is in L2, is that a strong condition? Do I have to assume my function is in both L1 and L2? Or if I assume one of them, do I get the other one for free? Do you have to assume continuity if your function is differentiable? No. no. <laughs> You can't be differentiable if you're not continuous. You know, you're looking at f of x plus h minus f of x over h. If f of x plus h doesn't go down to f of x, you don't have 0 over 0. You have no chance of having anything. So as soon as I say you're differentiable, you get continuity for free. So the question now is we have these two spaces. 
which do you think is the more strenuous assumption? That the function is integrable or that the function is square integrable? And not surprisingly, whichever one is the more restrictive assumption should probably give you better results. If you've done probability, you've seen Chebyshev's theorem versus the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem destroys Chebyshev because it assumes more. All Chebyshev says is finite mean, finite variance. And it gives you a bound, but the bound is nowhere near as good as what the central limit theorem will give you in many cases because the central limit theorem assumes more. All right, so this is a good place to stop. Hopefully we will have a wonderful mountain day.